Welcome to part two of Lead the Fight 2023. We will allow a few minutes for guests to log on. This is an interactive online event with trauma expert and best-selling author, Dr. Gabor Mate. Everyone joining online, please remember to submit your questions to Dr. Mate utilizing the Menti code that was emailed to you today as chat functions will be disabled during the event. For our guests here at the breakers, please use the notepads on your tables to write down your name, table number, and questions. If you have a question, raise the card. Thank you. Center for Child Counseling is honored to open Lead the Fight 2023, part two with Dr. Gabor Mate, presenting from his best-selling book on addiction and trauma in the realm of hungry ghosts. Thank you to our leading sponsors and all who have donated to Lead the Fight 2023. Our event coaches, Katie Leone and Julie Fisher Cummings, and our host site, the Breakers Palm Beach wish you a warm welcome. Now we are pleased to invite our event coacher and passionate children's advocate, Caddy Leone, to open this special international gathering. Good afternoon. I'd like to open this truly singular event by thanking our sponsors for their support, including my co-chair, Julie Fisher Cummings, the Breakers in this amazing space, Ashley Glass for once again serving as our MC, and all our generous Lead the Fight sponsors and, and donors. Welcome, and thank you all so much for joining us. Today, we are going to talk about and hopefully engage you, the leaders, thinkers, and doers in our community to join the fight against ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. I have been involved with the Center for Child Counseling for several years now and have learned a lot about the impact of ACEs on our children, families, and community. To help gain some perspective, adverse childhood experiences in a home are divorce, domestic violence, a parent in prison, mental instability in a parent or sibling, physical, mental, sexual abuse, food or home insecurity, drug or alcohol abuse, or feeling unloved, unsupported, or unsafe. When these experiences go unaddressed, leaving the child to deal with these traumas essentially alone, they impact every other aspect of their lives, including their health, ability to learn or gain stable employment, social behavior, and decision-making for the rest of their lives. ACEs that are not dealt with also negatively impact each and every one of us in myriad ways in our communities. As an example, every effort put forth to heal, educate, employ, foster, adopt, and rescue will eventually run into the wall that is the impact of unaddressed ACEs on a human being rendering our efforts largely ineffective. It's no secret that we are experiencing a mental health crisis in our country. The Center for Child Counseling has been on the front lines for years and is seeing firsthand how the situation is spiraling out of control. With over 600 families on a wait list for crisis counseling, we need more capacity. A friend of mine who works as a mental health counselor in Palm Beach County's high schools has 80 kids on a wait list in just one school. We need more capacity. The CDC just published the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. It yielded some startling and very scary results, amongst which was the finding that over 30%, 30% of high school girls have contemplated suicide. 
an increase of almost 60% in the last 10 years. We need more capacity. And to help further frame the discussion today, in our current systems model, inexplicably, we wait for a person, too often a child, to fall apart before we finally begin to pay attention. Over and over, we see it in one after another tragic school shooting. For example, after all the rhetoric and resources put forth over the years, where was anyone when there were clear signs that this person was struggling? No one was paying attention. But after the fact, oh, how we do pay attention. Now that this tragic broken soul, often analyzing the person's every move and decision leading up to his or her actions, and we will then spend whatever efforts and dollars are necessary to prosecute, jail, and yes, then even counsel the offender. But these efforts tragically come all too late for those who bore the brunt of this person's anguish. The time is now to recognize the value and necessity of prevention for all our sakes. And so, this is why you are here today. I was at a very difficult time in my life a long time ago, and a very wise friend of mine was frustrated with my unwillingness to listen to her advice. And she said to me, you know, your best thinking has gotten you where you're at. Maybe it's time to listen to someone else. In a similar way, despite the best efforts of the mental health field, here we are. Too many people are living lives that bear the mark of unaddressed ACEs to the detriment of all. So we need your perspective a fresh perspective, and we need your help. By bringing the knowledge and awareness you gain today back to your organizations and companies, your families, your friend groups, and your schools. Join us in this fight against ACEs. The health, happiness, and safety of everyone in our community is depending on it. Thank you for your time. It's now my pleasure to introduce our news partner, children advocate, and today's MC, Ms. Ashley Glass, anchor of WPTV's Today on Five to lead our event. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. I am completely honored to be here this afternoon with you all today for Lead the Fight Part Two. This is a live online international event bringing people together from all over the globe. I was just checking with our team. We have people tapping in from the UK, Canada, Ireland, Australia. This is truly a, a global conversation and dialogue we are going to have here today. This is a special occasion too, as in a moment we will visit with one of the most renowned experts in the fields of mental health, trauma and addiction, Dr. Gabor Mate. This discussion, it is very timely too, recent news of yet another school shooting, this time in Nashville, where children have lost their lives, others are traumatized for life at the hands of a person undoubtedly provoking violence due to the pain from their own unresolved trauma. Yet here we are again at an event focused on these very issues, urging our leaders to implement solutions because we do have answers. And we won't stop fighting until measures are widely adopted to prevent ACEs so that every children can go into a healthy and whole adult. The Fighting Aces initiative now in its seventh year is gaining more ground than ever. With your help, we continue to spark action around the public health crisis of adverse childhood experiences and trauma and are urging those in positions of power to recognize the lifelong health and social impacts Aces have on people and on entire communities. We are all on this journey together. We are all learning at every turn. As a journalist of more than 20 years and my most important role as a mom to two little girls, there is no issue more critical from where I sit than those that impact our youth. I pray for our next generation. I certainly hope that journalists down the road will read very different headlines than I found myself reading just this morning. The following quote was written by today's featured speaker. Think about this here. Safety is less about the lack of threat, safety is about the presence of connection. We know that therapy, safe relationships, caring adults, 
and a sense of belonging buffer and heal the scars of childhood trauma and can prevent the negative lifelong outcomes of adversity, mental health conditions, addictions, and poor health. At this point, I would like to view a short video from Center for Child Counseling sharing the urgency of ACEs prevention and education. So if I could please draw everyone's eyes to the screen. We don't have to wait for a child to have a mental health diagnosis. We don't have to wait for somebody to be so bullied and so angry and so socially isolated that they feel like the only thing that they can do is act out through shooting other people. I mean, these are really big issues within our country. And so we're hoping to bring a voice to some of that within our community and beyond. You can intervene early. You can prevent lifelong mental and behavioral health challenges. Play therapy is a modality, modality used for kids. Um, um, it allows them to play, because play is children's language. Sometimes they don't have the words to express their thoughts or their feelings, so them playing with toys is how it comes out. We focus a lot on social skills and communication. Um, there are a lot of big emotions sometimes, so it is also a lot of validating, normalizing, and um, assisting them with the conflict resolution. A lot of these young kids, again, don't have the words to say, you know, I don't like when you do that to me because it makes me frustrated. A lot of the times they'll have a temper tantrum. So in that moment when they have the temper tantrum is when we teach them how they're feeling, what they're thinking, and how we can solve this. Instead of throwing ourselves on the floor and screaming, crying, we still validate those feelings. But then through those moments, we teach them, you know, the feeling words, how to communicate, and how to resolve whatever is that it's bothering them. Ready? Yeah. We're going to go back to our teachers. Okay. Ready? We are seeing an increase in children who are struggling with everything now. We've seen an increase in anxiety, an increase in suicidal ideation, an increase in suicide attempts, an increase in depression, an increase in bullying. Coming out of the pandemic, this work really drives me. I think as a nation, we need to take this approach. We continue to take deep end approaches where we need to have widespread prevention and early intervention efforts. It is now my pleasure at this time to introduce our guest speaker for this afternoon, trauma and addiction expert, international best-selling author, Dr. Gabor Mate. I wanna tell you a little bit about him right now. Throughout his pioneering career, Dr. Mate has woven together scientific research, case histories, and his own insights and experience to present a broad perspective that enlightens and empowers people to promote their own healing and that of those around them. After 20 years of family practice, Dr. Mate worked closely with patients challenged by drug addiction and mental illness as well. Now a best-selling author of four books published in 30 languages, Dr. Mate is an internationally renowned speaker, highly sought after for his expertise on addiction, trauma, childhood development, and the relationship of stress and illness. His book informing today's discussion in the realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction, received the Hubert Evans Prize for Literary Nonfiction. And so now, joining us live from Canada, I want you to please give a very warm welcome so he can feel it all the way in Canada. And please help me welcome Dr. Gabor Mate. Hey, good afternoon, Dr. Mate. You have the room's attention. We are all so eager and excited to hear you speak and to hear your insights. 
Thank you. So just to remind me of the format, would you like to speak for a while and then take questions? Is that what you'd like yeah, me to Yeah, we would love to hear from you uh, first, if that's okay. And then yeah. um, everyone here today that's gathered would like to pose some questions to you as well. Perfect. So allow me to speak for a few minutes and I'll stop and uh, take it from there. First, first of all, thank you for inviting me, for honoring me with your trust. Um, I want to say, um, for the sake of completeness, I'm the best-selling author, not of four, but of five books, including the most recent one, which I'll dare to show you, and I hope you'll get it. It's called The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. And this last Sunday, it spent its 18th week on the New York Times bestsellers list, and it's being published in 30 countries internationally. Now, the reason I mention this book is because as much as we need to concentrate and emphasize the importance of preventing those adverse childhood experiences that were mentioned in the introduction, I think the prevention of mental health issues in children and adults goes ways beyond, goes way beyond the adverse childhood experiences. Those are certainly dramatic and traumatic impacts on child development for reasons that I'll mention. But there are many other negative factors that impact the mental health of our children and adult population that the AC studies do not cover because they were not designed to. That's not a criticism of the AC studies, but it means that there's more to mental health than simply um, those 10 adversities that were mentioned in the introduction. Now, when I worked in Vancouver's downtown east side, which is here in Vancouver, Canada, which is North America's most concentrated area of drug use. In a few square block radius, we have more people using drugs, thousands, than any other small area of North America. I was also the physician there for 12 years, including at North America's then only supervised injection site. And it's certainly true that all my clients down there um, had extreme, the high scores on the ACE, um, um, scale many of them in physically in 12 years of work done there i had not a single female patient who had not been sexually abused and all the men had suffered um, endured um, indignities and, and intrusions on their body and mind in childhood that are almost beyond belief to recount and i do speak about that in the book that was mentioned in the realm of from the ghosts and I just want to say a few words about addiction, but then I want to broaden the conversation around mental health to beyond the ACE subject matter. So the question of addiction is one that's really poorly understood either by society as a whole or by the medical profession. In fact, it's rather non-scientific. Even the medical view is rather non-scientific. As much as values it may contain, it leaves out huge aspects of the science without which we're really hobbled in our approach to addiction or mental health in general. So first of all, let me begin. So society in general believes that addiction is a choice, that people that choose to behave in these dysfunctional ways. And since it's a choice, they ought to be punished for it if their addiction relates to illegal substances. And the illegality of which itself is another thing we could actually explore in some interesting detail. But the assumption in the legal system and in the school system is that people are making choices for which they need to be punished. Now, let me tell you the news. I worked with heavily drug addicted people people addicted to crystal meth, to fentanyl, to opiates of all kinds, to nicotine, to caffeine, to alcohol, to marijuana, to sniffing glue. I've, never met, I've yet to meet a single human being who ever chose to be an addict. Nobody wakes up one morning and says, I'm gonna be an addict. So that the idea of choice, which underlies the legal system, which underlies the fact that there's hundreds of thousands of people in jails, millions perhaps, in North America, because supposedly they made a bad choice, is utter fiction. That's the first point. Now the medical view, which is that addiction is a 
inherited brain disease or largely inherited brain disease is certainly a step forward. Because if somebody has a brain disease, at least you're not going to punish them for it, especially not if they inherited it. How can you blame somebody for their genes? And the idea that it's a disease uh, does afford the possibility of treatment, which again is very important. And if somebody relapses, you're not going to be disdaining and demeaning them any more than you'd relapse some, you would attack or criticize somebody who relapses with their multiple sclerosis or their cancer. So certainly the medical view is an important, both scientific and humane step forward, but is it accurate? No, it isn't. So let me give you an addiction. I'm sorry, you probably got addictions. Let me give you a definition of addiction that uh, I think is not particularly controversial. So an addiction is manifested in any behavior in which an individual finds pleasure or relief and therefore craves, but then suffers negative consequences as a result of, and is unable to give up despite the negative consequences. So the hallmarks of addiction is craving, pleasure, relief in the short term, harm in the long term, inability to give it up. That's what an addiction is. Now, please notice something. I said nothing about substances. Certainly, addictions can entail and target substances, the legal ones, such as nicotine and caffeine and alcohol, which, by the way, between them cause much more disease than the illegal ones. That's just a medical fact, except when it comes to overdoses and so on. Or the illegal substances, such as I've already mentioned, crystal meth and cocaine and, and, and uh, the opiates from fentanyl to heroin and so, you know, delauded, whether they're manufactured by pharmaceutical companies or sold illegally by drug pushers, the opiates, highly addictive, yes. But addiction can also involve non-substances, such as eating, gambling, shopping, work, extreme sports, the internet, gaming, cell phones. I could go on. Any behavior that you crave and gives you temporary pleasure or relief and causes harm and you don't give up, that's what an addiction is. Now, um, I can kind of see you all in a very small screen on the top of my screen, but let me ask you, those of you that are in the room there, if according to my definition here, you've ever had an addictive uh, pattern in your life, please just raise your hand, okay? All right. Those of you that are raising your hand, I'm going to ask you a question, which I'm not able to receive your answers directly. But here's what I'm going to ask you. Not what was wrong with the addiction, but what was right about it. We know what was wrong with it. What was right about it? What I mean what was right about it is, what did it do for you in the short term? What did it give you that you wanted and you craved? Now, here's what I can tell you. I've spoken to multiple thousands of people all over the world from the US to Canada to the UK to Europe Turkey elsewhere and when I ask this question what did the addiction do for you here are the answers that I get and and, and again I'm not asking what you were addicted to I don't care whether it was gambling or pornography or drugs I'm looking at the temporary benefit that you were seeking from that behavior. What do people tell me? They tell me it gave me relief from emotional pain. It offered me, gave me an escape from distressing thoughts. It gave me a sense of control. It gave me a sense of belonging. It gave me pleasure. It gave me peace of mind temporarily, stress relief. Now, these are the answers that people give. Now here's what I'm asking you pleasure, emotional pain relief, escape from distressing thoughts, peace of mind, sense of control, sense of belonging, pleasure, 
are these good things or bad things? In themselves, they're good things. In themselves, they're qualities that we all want in our lives, which means that the addiction wasn't your primary problem. Your primary problem was emotional pain, emotional stress, loss of capacity to experience pleasure, loss of a sense of belonging, a loss of a sense of control. So the addiction comes along to solve a problem. Now, it's a solution that creates more problems. Of course, that's its nature. But it wasn't a primary problem. It didn't start off as a disease. It was started off as an attempt to solve a life problem. And then the question is, why did you have a loss of pleasure on God's green earth with all that's available to us? How come you couldn't feel pleasure? Because something in you got shut down. That's why. As a one old baby, you knew how to experience pleasure. Then you lost it. Something happened. Sense of belonging, same thing. Sense of control, same thing. The lack of inner peace, where did that come from? Stress that you couldn't handle, how come? Emotional pain, how come? In fact, all of these states, loss of pleasure, loss of belonging, loss of control, these are all forms of emotional pain. And then the question becomes, and this is my mantra on the addiction, don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. Not why the addiction, but why the pain. And if you understand, if you want to understand why the pain, don't look at somebody's genes, look at their lives, what happened to them. Now certainly, the more of these adverse childhood experiences somebody has to endure, the greater their pain. No question about it. That's why the more ACEs you have exponentially, the greater your risk for addiction. So by the time you're a male child has six, six of those 10 that were mentioned, their risk of becoming a substance using, injection using addict is 4,600% 4, greater than that of somebody with no such experiences, a 46-fold increase. Nothing to do with genetics, just pain and the need to escape pain. So that's perfectly true. To those 10 ACEs, we have to add two more, which are social ones. One is poverty and the other is racism, because they too impose pain and they too uh, predispose to addictive behaviors as a form of escape especially combined with the other aces. So that's tr true. Now, I could talk to you about the brain biology of addiction. Let me say something about the opiates, first of all. The opiates come from the opium plant in Afghanistan. And they're the most powerful painkillers that we have. We've used opiates in medicine for 3,000 years. When I worked in palliative care, looking after terminally ill people, I prescribed high quantities of opiates every day, and I was just so grateful that I could, because without the opiates, a lot of people would die in pain. But the opiates don't only provide physical pain relief, they also provide emotional pain relief. And if you want to ask, why is it that the opiates work in the human brain? Like, why is it that the derivative of a plant that goes in Afghanistan has such a powerful impact in the human brain here in North America? The answer is because in our brains, in our bodies, we have receptors for opiates. Receptors are molecules where the opiate molecule, here's an opiate molecule, here's a receptor. The molecule, the messenger fits into the receptor. Now there's a cell that's going to react to that receptor uh, messenger interaction. So we have opiate receptors in our guts, in our brains, and elsewhere. Why do we have opiate receptors? Because we have our own opiates that our bodies and brains manufacture. And those opiates are called endorphins. And endorphin means endogenous or internal morphine-like substance. Why do we have endorphins in our body? 
Well, if you want to understand why people get addicted to opiates, you have to understand what do our own endorphins do for us. I'll tell you what they do for us. Three essential things, many things actually, but three essential things. First, pain relief, physical, emotional pain relief. Life is full of pain. There has to be some internal pain relief. So there is the endorphins, both for physical pain and emotional pain. You know, the three or four year old, the two year old who runs around falling and bumping their head and their knees and their behinds and so on. And they get up and run around. Why can't they do that? Because they have a lot of endorphins in their brains at that time. They have the internal pain relievers. Number one, pain relief. Number two, the endorphins make possible the experience of pleasure and joy and reward and elation. Uh, life is hard. Imagine your life with a joy, pleasure, elation, reward. So that's the second thing they do. The third thing they do is the most important thing they do. The endorphins make possible a little thing called love. And by love, I mean the attachment relationship between mother or parent and infant. When there's a joyful, interactive, connected dynamic between the parent and the child, both the parent and the child have endorphin activity in their brains. This is why we get so addicted to our cute little babies because of the endorphins. Now, without that, that wouldn't happen. So little mice whose endorphin receptors have been genetically knocked out by laboratory manipulation they will not cry for their mothers on separation. And what would that mean in the wild? Their death. That's how important the opiates, the endorphins are. Now, do you know who the opiate addicts are? People that didn't get the love they needed when they were kids. When I asked a patient of mine, a sex trade worker with HIV, 27 years old, what does the heroin do for you? She said, the first time I did heroin, it felt like a warm, soft hug. Now, the reason that adverse childhood experiences predispose to addictions in such dramatic proportions is because under the impact of those experiences, the human brain doesn't develop its own endorphins. Because for brain development, and I'm going to read you a, a, a couple of sentences from a very important article from the journal Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the American Pediatric Academy. And the article comes from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. And this sums up decades of brain developmental research, which I hate to tell you, the average doctor still doesn't hear about. As a physician, I can tell you, they don't. But here's how the brain develops. The architecture of the brain is constructed to an ongoing process that begins before birth continues into adulthood and establishes either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all the health, learning, and behavior that follow. Let me go to that sentence again. The architecture of the brain, I'm talking about the circuits, the networks, the connections, the synapses, the systems, the neurochemicals. The architecture of the brain is constructed, constructed to an ongoing process that begins before birth and continues into adulthood. You know what that means? That the prevention of addiction needs to begin at the first prenatal visit. Because the stresses on the mom, the emotional stresses of the mother during pregnancy, we've known for decades now, impact the developing brain of the infant and have deleterious effects. So the more stressed parents are during pregnancy, and this is not the fault of individual mothers. We're talking about a social system here that stresses pregnant women. The more stresses and emotion, uh, emotional stresses a woman experiences during pregnancy, the greater that risk is for the child to develop conditions that are predisposed to ADHD, mental health issues, addictions, and so on. This is not even controversial. Secondly, this process begins before this process begins before birth continues into adulthood, which means that our most sacred task, surely, 
as a society, including in our schools, is not the teaching of skills and facts, but the ensuring of healthy brain development. Because it continues into adulthood. Now, any kind of development requires the right conditions. If you're a gardener, you're going to really inquire as to the particular plant that you're cultivating. What are the needs that this plant has to fully develop in a healthy way? Nutrition, irrigation, sunlight, minerals. The same with human beings. Our development, our brain development depends on the right conditions. It's not automatic. I'll read this sentence again, then I'll go on to the next one. The architecture of the brain. And by the way, <laughs> let me just acknowledge something. I know that I generate a certain degree of heat when I speak. And I do that especially when I have a short period of time to say so many things that I want to tell you. So if any intensity uh, that, that you might be um, experiencing from me, please don't take it personally. Um, it's simply that I'm so passionate about getting this message across. And it's such an important message. And I can only say so much in a short period of time. So I'll read you this first sentence again. The architecture of the brain is constructed to an ongoing process that begins before birth, continues into adulthood, and establishes either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all the health, learning, and behavior that follow. Not some of the health, learning, and behavior, all the health, learning, and behavior that follow. That's the first sentence. All these kids with learning difficulties, it's not genetic. It has to do with how the architecture of the brain was constructed. The second sentence. The interactions of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain. Do you want to get that? It's not genes. It's the environment acting on the genes that shapes the circuitry of the developing brain and is critically influenced by the mutual responsiveness of adult-child relationships, particularly in the early childhood years, which actually means people that the most important influence on the healthy development of the brain is the quality of adult-child really emotional relationships. That's what shapes the brain. Now you can understand why, why kids who experience those ACEs will have brains that are predisposed for addictions and mental health issues and autoimmune disease and all kinds of other problems and dysfunctional behaviors and so on. But, and here's the big but, it doesn't just take ACEs to interfere with healthy brain development. They do, and they have to be taken into account. But we have to get to the larger issue of trauma. Now, the adverse childhood experiences are traumatic, but they're not the trauma. Trauma means, and I'm actually, again, at the risk of being self-serving here or self-promoting, I mentioned this book again, The Myth of Normal, the first chapters on trauma. Trauma is not what happens to us. Trauma means wound. That's the meaning of the word. It's a Greek word for wound. Trauma is not what happens to us, but the wound that we sustain as a result of what happens to us. So those adverse childhood experiences are traumatic, but the wound is what happens inside of us as a result of them. And one of the things that happens as a result of adverse childhood experiences is severe emotional pain, which then people try to solve partly by addictive behaviors. That's why I keep saying, not why the addiction, but why the pain. And yes, the medical view is right that the brain is involved in addictions, but if the medical view misses the point that that brain was created by life experience, because the brain is a social organ, scientifically not even controversial, dependent on its development on the conditions of childhood and pregnancy. Now, it also follows that you can wound kids not just by doing bad things to them, but by also not giving them their needs. So there's lots of families where there was no ACEs, but kids are still in deep trouble. And the reason, as mentioned in the introduction, the number of childhood suicides is going up, 
childhood distress, anxiety, ADHD, uh, depression. Why? Because the conditions of healthy development are less and less available to parents in this toxic culture. We're not blaming parents. We're saying that the environment has become so inimical to healthy parenting. Now, you can wound kids by the bad things, such as mentioned in the ACE roster, but you can also wound kids not by the bad things that happen to them, but by the good things that don't happen. Children are born with certain needs. The human infant is an expectation for a certain environment. What do I mean by an expectation? Our lungs are an expectation for oxygen. Our lungs don't expect oxygen. They're an expectation for oxygen. If there wasn't oxygen in the environment, there'd be no lungs. Our lungs evolved in response to the presence of oxygen. So they're an expectation for oxygen. The human creature evolved as an expectation for certain conditions in the environment. And we evolved over millions of years and over hundreds of thousands of years in small band hunter-gatherer groups where there's certain things that children received when a human infant is born, they're an expectation for certain conditions. You don't have to have aces to wound children. Just give them an environment in which their inborn expectations are not met. Now, what are these inborn expectations? So in the book, The Myth of Normal, I talk about the four irreducible needs of children. And one of them was mentioned. In fact, two of them were mentioned in that beautiful little video that we saw in the introduction. So first of all, the human infant is an expectation for an attachment relationship. Attachment means closeness and proximity with others for the sake of being taken care of or taking care of the other. So the parent is attached to the child, the child is attached to the parent. This is attachment dynamic is characteristic of mammals, not just human beings, mammals. When an elephant infant is born, you know what happens? When the mother goes into labor, the other mother elephants stand around in a circle and when the infant plops into the dirt, all the mothers touch them with their trunks. The elephant baby is an expectation for communal love. So is the human infant. So an attachment relationship in which the infant is absolutely secure, that's the first expectation. Not that the infant has, but that the infant is. The second expectation, I'm listing you the four irreducible needs of childhood. Irreducible meaning if you don't meet them, you're going to get dysfunction, unhealthy development. The second expectation, irreducible need, is rest. Rest means that the infant and the child should not have to work to make their relationship work. They should not have to be good, compliant, cute, sweet, pretty, successful, smart, nothing. They just need to exist and know that that relationship is there for them no matter what. Now, when parents are very stressed, they're utterly incapable of giving that child that rest because in a stressed environment, the child is stressed and then takes on the work of trying to deal with that stress. So that's the second expectation. The third irreducible soul need is, and we saw this in the video, when it was these difficult emotions were mentioned, the emotions are not difficult, people. What's difficult is when the child doesn't have this support for them. Children, infants have the need, young children have the need to be able to experience all their emotions and have them validated, accepted, and regulated by regulated loving adults. That's a need of the child. Now, our brains are wired for certain emotions, not just our brains, the brains of all mammals. They include fear, grief, 
pain, joy, love, playfulness, curiosity. A child needs to be able to experience all those emotions and have them validated and supported by adults. In this society, we pick and choose. Kid, you can have this emotion, but you can't have that one. We're subverting the needs of kids. Yes, the child needs to be able to be angry and not be punished for it. I'm not talking about permissive parenting of allowing destructive behavior. I'm talking about validating the emotion. And kids will get angry. If you're doing your job as a parent, your kids will get angry. You know why? Because one and a half year old, two years old, they're going to want a cookie before dinner, and you're not going to give them a cookie before dinner. So they're going to get frustrated. You need to validate the frustration without punishing them for it or without giving them that cookie. But the emotion needs to be validated. If they're not, the child will begin to depress their emotions in order to be acceptable to you. What's another word for depression? What? Sorry, what's another word uh, for depressing emotions is to push it down. Guess what the disease of depression is all about? It's about kids having to push down their emotions because the environment doesn't know how to respond to it. That's the third need shown in that video, is the need for children to be able to experience their emotions and to have an empathetic adult be able to channel it and regulate it for them and to validate it for them and to give them language for it. That's the third need of the child. The fourth need of the child was also mentioned in that little film, play. Creative play, spontaneous creative play out there in nature is an essential need of all mammals, including human beings. Play is much more important for healthy brain development than academic information is. Our kids don't play anymore. You know how they play? They play with artificial gadgets. This is not play. This is addictive programming. So here's what I'm saying. Yes. The adverse childhood experiences are very important to pay attention to, and we have to have to add to them poverty and racism as well. But many more kids are also being hurt, not because of those childhood adversities, but because their essential human needs are not met in this increasingly toxic and stressed culture. And so I could then talk to you about one of my I've been diagnosed with two mental health conditions myself. One of them ADHD in my mid fifties. That became my first book. It's called Scattered Minds. It's just been republished in the States. It was a New York Times bestseller list for a week, uh, about a month ago. It's about ADHD. And everybody says ADHD is a genetic disease. No, it ain't. What it actually is, is the tuning out of ADHD which is the hallmark of ADHD, which I've had all my life, that tuning out, that absent-mindedness is a coping mechanism. When a child is stressed, because the parents are stressed, and again, I'm not talking about bad parenting or any fault or blame directed at parents, but when parents are stressed, the highly sensitive infant is also stressed. How does the infant deal with stress? Can't leave it. They tune out. But when are they tuning out? When their brain is developing? Why are we seeing so much more ADHD these days? Because parenting environment is so stressed and more kids are tuning out as a way of coping with it. And again, from this Harvard article on, um, on uh, brain development, I'll quote you one more paragraph and then I'll stop talking and take questions. Although believe me, I could talk for the next 10 hours and not exhaust what I would wish to tell you. But let me read you this paragraph again, uh, or let me quote again from this article for you. This is from the beginning of the article. Here's what it says. Growing scientific evidence demonstrates that social and physical environments that threaten human development because of scarcity, stress, or instability can lead to short-term physiologic and psychological adjustments that are necessary for immediate survival and adaptation, but which may come at a significant cost to long-term outcomes in learning, behavior, health, and longevity. In other words, the way we cope with early adversity helps us endure 
and those same coping mechanisms become source of problems later on. So self-soothing that a child does, because they're not being soothed, the rocking and the thumb sucking and so on, that kid will be very well later on soothe themselves through addictions. But it becomes as a coping mechanism. The tuning out of ADHD become, begins as a coping mechanism. The pushing down of emotions and depression becomes as a cope, begins as a coping mechanism, which also means when we're treating these kids, it's not the behaviors and the symptoms that we have to respond to, but the underlying emotional needs that those behaviors and symptoms express and the same thing with adults. It's not enough just to focus on the addictive behavior. You also have to ask, not why the addiction, but why the pain? What happened to you? And how can we help you heal the trauma that's underlying your behavior? Well, that's a very small nutshell in which to squeeze a lot of information. Um, thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take your questions now. Dr. Mate, uh, on behalf of everybody in this room today, everybody joining us virtually, just thank you so much. That was enlightening. Uh, start to finish, you know, as a working, busy parent, I was especially struck by when you talked about a, a child's ability to rest in this relationship, you know, with their caregivers, because we get so busy and stressed, as you said, that... Um, I just, I love that you underscored the importance of a, a child just being able to innately rest in that love and relationship. Um, we're gonna take some questions. Uh, everybody will see a note card right at the, the front, of their, front of their notebook. If you could write down one question you have for Dr. Mate and our team, just raise it up when you're done and our team will come and collect um, the cards from you. And Dr. Mate, while everybody's kind of writing their questions, um, I wanna ask you about your childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we talked in the beginning, as I was introducing you, that your ability to talk to this room and to people all over the globe, you know, comes from a lot of places. Tell us how your childhood, you know, has inspired a lot of the work you do today. Well, so um, in my case, it's actually my first year and a half of life that was the decisive influence on my future course. Um, I was born in January 1944 to Jewish parents in Budapest, Hungary. When I was two months of age, the German army, the Wehrmacht, occupied my country and proceeded, and then the Germans proceeded to annihilate the Jewish population of Hungary. And within the Germans marched into Hungary uh, March 17th or so of 1944, I was two months of age. And this is a story I've told before. But the, uh, uh, my mother phoned the pediatrician the next day and said, would you please come and see Gabor because he's crying all the time. And the doctor said, well, of course I'll come to see him, but I should tell you, all my Jewish babies are crying. Hmm. Now, what was that all about? I didn't know anything about Nazis or Hitler or genocide. I was responding to the stresses and terrors of my mother. And that was my first year of life. The day that my grandparents were killed in Auschwitz, my mother's breast milk dried up. When I was 11 months, I mean, I don't have to tell you the conditions under which I lived my life. My father was away in forced labor. My mother didn't know if he was dead or alive. Of course, I tuned out a lot when my brain was developing. How else could I survive? When I was 11 months old, my mother gave me a complete stranger in the street of Budapest. I've been on that very same spot just a few months ago where this happened. The building is still there. Wow. Now, my mother did this to save my life, which it did, because I could not have survived where we were living. But what message did I get? I got the message that I wasn't wanted. That's the wound. The trauma is not that my mother gave me to a stranger. That's the traumatic event. The trauma the wound is that I'm not lovable. Why else would they give me away? So as I've often said, 40 years later, I'm a workaholic doctor. Why am I a workaholic doctor? Because I'm trying to justify my existence. Because the message I got is that my existence is not valid. I'm not wanted. 
So I'm a workaholic doctor. The world loves me. I'm busy. I'm successful. I'm well paid, respected, admired for my availability. And I'm never home for my kids. Mm. What message do they get? The same one I got. This is how we pass trauma on unwittingly from one generation to the next. And I'll say one more thing. Um, in my new book, The Myth of Normal, the first chapter opens with an episode that I've talked about publicly before of me arriving home from a speaking trip in Vancouver <laughs> seven or eight years ago when I was young and stupid, you know? And uh, I'm feeling really good because it was a good trip. Then I get a text from my wife who's supposed to pick me up at the airport. And it says, I haven't left home yet. Do you still want me to come? And I go into a rage. And when I get home by taxi, I'm not even looking at her. What's that all about? It's about the emotional memory of being abandoned. I'm being triggered into an infant state. And when I saw my mother again after a separation, I didn't look at her for several days. Mm. That's the defensive response of the infant on separation from the mother is, I was so hurt when you abandoned me that I'm not going to allow myself to be so vulnerable ever again. 70 years later, 72 years later, my spouse of almost half a century is not there at the airport. And I'm experiencing that same pain. I have the same infantile reaction. That's trauma. Trauma is a wound that hasn't healed yet. Now, these days when she doesn't pick me up at the airport, I say, uh-huh, and I'll take a taxi home. Because I've dealt, <laughs> I've dealt with it. But, that, but, but my tendency in our relationship is when I feel hurt or disappointed is to kind of withdraw, to get defensive, avoidant. That's because of what happened to me early. So the impacts of trauma can last for a long time until you work them through. So that now, of course, working all this through and then working with as a physician, realizing that just about everybody I worked with, whether it's chronic autoimmune disease, malignancy, or um, addictions or mental health issues, so much of it is rooted in childhood trauma. Then I began to look at the literature, the science, and putting together with my own insights, observations, and internal experiences, and my own journey of healing, this is what has led to the body of work that is now evident in my five books. But so much of it had to do with my own stuff, no question about it. Thank you for sharing all that uh, with us. And again, five books. I apologize for my fact error earlier. No, that, that, <laughs> In a that's journalist, okay. that, uh, that's just not okay, a fact error. Five no. books. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kathy Leone, if you could make your way up here, um, and I want to ask you one more question, Dr. Monte, as she's uh, making her way up here. Uh, yeah. we, we've learned a lot in these lead the fight discussions about the need to have this one person, the safe space of a person, you know, yeah. all the way through our, our lifetime. Who has, who's been that person for you? Well, um, that throws me back on my back foot for a minute. Um, you know, in my childhood, um, in a certain sense, nobody, um, uh, my, um, well, that's not true. Um, so I had an aunt who just loved me unconditionally. Hmm. Um, my parents were actually good parents in most ways. Most of my difficulties stem from my first year of infancy, which my parents had no control over. But they were a fairly functional, mutually respectful couple. Um, but emotionally, they were not all that in tune. So I don't know that I ever had the experience of being understood as a child. In fact, I didn't, except perhaps by my aunt. Um, as an adult, I can tell you who that is. It's my wife. And uh, sometimes she understands me all too well. I wish she didn't, but she does. You know? <laughs> um, and that's what I say in my new book, is that my misfortune is to be married to somebody who understands me. Um, <laughs> the relationship, the adult relationship, where I'm expected to be myself, not my role, but my real self, has been a really powerful, um, fertile context for my own healing. So I would say 
it's been mostly my wife in my life um but you know in 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 one of her books the great alice miller the psychotherapist who wrote the drama of the gifted child which is a seminal work on childhood trauma that's not the book but in one of her other books she asks why is it that some kids who are undergo terrible experiences still do relatively okay and she says what makes the difference is the presence of what she calls an empathetic witness an empathetic witness is not necessarily somebody who can rescue you from adversity, but somebody who can at least validate your emotions. Because the biggest impact of trauma, or the biggest mm, impetus for trauma, is not just the bad things that happen, but that the child is so alone with it, and there's nobody there to understand and validate it. So never underestimate your power either working with adults or children, if you show up as an empathetic witness, there's so much healing that you can initiate just by a compassionate presence. Oh, I love that. Thank you, Dr. Mate. I hope your wife is in a room on the other side of a wall and heard you say all that about her too. Kathy? Yes, thank you. Um, and you actually sort of segued into my question, uh, Dr. Mate, but you know, when I first started getting engaged in this work, I thought, well, I'm not really a trained professional. What can I possibly do? There's so much trauma in our society, in our community. But um, your book sort of suggests, as you just mentioned, that there are things that we can do as individuals in our community, in our schools. And I guess for the benefit of all of us here, um, can you speak about that a little bit? Um, rather than it being this huge effort that takes all of us moving in the same direction, which would be just about impossible. What can each of us do and bring back to our organizations, our companies, our schools, our mm -hmm. friend groups? Um, can you give us some thoughts there? Sure. So first of all, I hate to say this, but I'll say it anyway. Um, if you're not a trained professional, that's probably a step forward. Because unfortunately, <laughs> the unfortunately the training of our professionals is so inadequate and sometimes so misleading so let me tell you an astonishing fact despite the fact that the ac studies have been published now internationally for close to 30 years now and despite all the research into trauma its impact on the physiology of the brain its impact on the personality its consequences in terms of physical and mental health. Despite all that research on trauma, the average medical student still doesn't get a single lecture on trauma in their education. Unbelievable, but true. Many psychologists don't receive training in trauma. They receive training in how to deal with behaviors, but not with the traumatic basis of those behaviors. Teachers, who you think anybody would get lectures on brain development, because actually all the brain is developing through all the school years, the average teacher never gets a single lecture on brain development, let alone on trauma. So that I only wish that the only problem was that there's not enough trained professionals. The problem is that many trained professionals don't even get the basics of what's actually important. So in the schools, for example, kids who misbehave, they're punished, bullies, zero tolerance. I once was gonna write a book on bullying. I did quite a bit of research, didn't have time to do it, but I saw one big study that looked at bullying literature and it said zero tolerance, zero evidence. These bullies, you know who they are? The kids who are hurt who don't feel important, who need to establish their importance by being stronger than some other little kid. It's not deliberate bad behavior. Now, I'm not saying it should be allowed or encouraged. I'm saying that bully needs to be embraced and loved. So what you can do is all these people that are dysfunctional, whether they're children or adults, you cannot mistake them for their behavior. You can see the hurting human being underneath that behavior. 
Now, again, I'm not talking about permissiveness or coddling people, but I'm talking about seeing them for what's really going on. If you can see human beings for the hurt creatures that so many of us are, and rather than judging them, demeaning them, um, simply punishing them, but actually seeing both the, the pain that's underneath the behavior, number one, and number two, see the human being that has the potential to heal, has the potential to grow, which all human beings do at any age, just seeing each other that way, what a difference that would make. As we told you when we got started today too, this is a conversation. So if you haven't written down your question yet, please do that, hold it up and our team will come by and get it. I'd like to invite uh, board chair, Dr. Eugenia Millinder up now to ask a question of Dr. Mate. Dr. Monte, thank you so much for um, sharing all your information, but more importantly for being so transparent on how your passion has driven you to do your work and your own experiences. And I think that's true for many of us that do this work. Um, we, yes. we understand it from a different perspective that others don't, and hopefully won't never do that. But So with that in mind, my conversation and my question is really more about this toxic environment we consistently live on, right? We are being exposed to um, ongoing stressors such as um, school shootings. It seems to be happening more and more often. Um, racism, discrimination, police brutality, poverty, um, housing disparities. And this is just ongoing. And it's an external factor, right? How would you suggest individuals, not professionals and professionals, students, how can we prevent or even address transgenerational trauma as it relates to external factors and environmental stressors? Well, that's an extraordinarily important and um, even more extraordinarily difficult question to answer. Um, here in Canada, um, where indigenous people make up five or 6% of our population, 50% of the women in jail are indigenous. 30 or 40% of the men in jail are indigenous. The addiction, suicide, mental health issues, physical health issues, rates on an indigenous population is much higher. Indigenous, an indigenous woman in Canada has six times the rate of rheumatoid arthritis. It's not genetic. Before colonization, they had no rheumatoid arthritis. It's purely a reflection of trauma and stress. Mm. How do we address these issues as individuals? Well, let me take a stab at that answer, but it's gonna be a very inadequate answer. First of all, the biggest impact of trauma is that you take it personally. The trauma induces a shame-based view of yourself. So as a Jew in Eastern Europe, I was ashamed of being Jewish. Why? A friend of mine came to my defense once when some bullies were attacking me for being Jewish and the friend said, leave him alone. It's not his fault that he's Jewish. <laughs> nice. It's a fault, but it's not his fault. <laughs> so the shameless view of the self, the American black uh, psychologist Dr. Ken Hardy talks about the assaulted sense of self, which is where the assaulted person takes on the view of the assaulter of themselves. So in the book, The Myth of Normal, I quote Malcolm X, who is describing how he used to conk his hair. He had this curly hair, Afro hair, and he would put corrosive chemicals on his scalp to try and straighten his hair to look like a white man. And at some point he says to his people, where did you learn that your curly hair was ugly, that your lips are in too big and your nose is the wrong shape? So the trauma results in this assaulted sense of self. So when you, and again, in the myth of normal, the Canadian indigenous woman writer describes how they were sitting around the family dinner and the father says to the kids, well, you know, we're Indians. 
and her brother says to the father, yeah, but aren't we at least human beings too, in part? So this assaulted sense of self. So what I say to individuals is, notice how you loathe yourself. Notice how you reject yourself and don't buy into it. It's the impact of your trauma, which includes social, economic, and racial trauma over generations. It's not yours. It's not you. It doesn't reflect who you are. So don't buy into it. Don't make it about yourself. Don't believe that there's something wrong with you. We want to keep what, this conversation. No, no that's, that's the first thing. Now, the second thing Sorry. is those social questions can't be solved on the individual level. They can't be. These are social questions. You know, the fact that uh, American Black women, the more experience of racism they have, the greater the risk for asthma. Well, yeah, I can talk to that individual and say, do you take on the view? Are you being stressed because you actually believe that there's something wrong with you? And I can help them that way. But, uh, but, but on the social level, the answer to racism is not individual. It's a social answer. Hi, I just have, I was yeah, asked please. to ask we my question. Invite, please, okay. Wanna... I have a concern that you might have already answered this, but they asked me to answer, ask my question anyway. Yeah. But before I do, I just want to say I felt like I've been through a therapeutic session. Um, so it's been very hard for me to listen to you. So I want to ask, if, if the essential human needs aren't met, like you talked about, can the damage be reversed once one reaches adulthood? Or will we always be a damaged person? Sorry. Well, first of all, thank you. I never think of anybody as damaged. That's not language that I ever use. People are hurt, but they're not damaged. That's the first point. Why they're not damaged? Because the recovery, the possibility of recovery and healing is always there. So if the, if, the, if the potential recovery and healing is always there, how can we talk about people being damaged? They're hurt. And there's responses to that hurt. But that doesn't mean they're damaged. Now, is recovery and healing possible? Let me give you two answers. What does the word recovery mean? I mean, I used to be an English teacher, by the way, before I went to medical school. So I pay a lot of attention to the meaning of words. What does it mean to recover something? It means to find it again. What do people find when they recover? You know what they find? They find their true selves that never got damaged. So there's no damage that goes out there. And there's this phenomenon called neuroplasticity, which is the capacity of the brain at any age, as long as there's consciousness, at any age to develop new circuits that will override the old dysfunctional circuits. That's called neuroplasticity. It's been studied in rats, in mice, and in human beings. It's real. And to make it more personal, <laughs> let me just tell you something. I often say this. I just turned 79. I'm so grateful that I'm not as young and stupid as I was when I was 78. <laughs> so I'm telling you, it is possible. And uh, the question is, how can we support ourselves and each other in that process? But there's no question that it's possible. And you know what? I could show you a video I have on my computer. I will not, just for lack of time, but I wish I could. It's from an inmate at a Texas, um, what's it called? Where they put uh, de death row. This man has been on death row for 20 years now for a crime he committed when he was 18 in a traumatized kid who had no adults to belong to, so he joined a gang, which gave him a sense of belonging, but which also led him into all kinds of criminal activity, at the end of which he ended up killing somebody, at which point the court decided that he's not a worthwhile human being anymore, he needs to be killed. And the appeals have been going on for 10, 20 years now. So he's on death row and he sent me a video message thanking me for my work on trauma. And he said, I've meditated, I've become aware, I've taken responsibility for what I did. 
I have tremendous remorse for what I participated in. And I love life. And what he does, does he does online courses for kids to make sure that they don't follow his path. But you've never seen a more conscious, more present, and more loving human being. So is healing possible? I'm telling you something. If healing is possible on a death row in Texas, it's possible anywhere. Hmm. Dominique, I want to look to you in the back and see if we could bring in a, a question now from someone joining us virtually. Again, we have people tapping in from all over the world for this discussion with Dr. Mate. Um, so if you could bring in a question, Dominica, from someone uh, online, that'd be great. Yes, we do have a great question. Uh, someone is asking, at Center for Child Counseling, we work with a lot of children of parents who are addicted. They wanted to know, how can you explain addiction to children? Well, I'd have to know a bit more, for example, how old are the kids? Um, but most, for the most part, you know, older kids, you can explain that your parent has got a problem that they're not doing it deliberately, but this problem is very difficult for them and very difficult for you. But the main thing I would do with these kids is not explain anything to them, but to validate their own experience. So it's not so much the, the danger with explaining things to kids too much, like your mother and father suffered and now they're using a substance you know that'll just make the child feel more responsible for the parent there's a tendency in kids growing up in those homes already to take responsibility for the suffering of the parents those of you that grew up in homes for example where a parent was an alcoholic you know what it's like you become the parent and that becoming a parent is a reversal of roles that is really harmful to the child i wouldn't encourage that what I would do with these kids is talk to them about, boy, it must be hard for you. You must feel really sad sometimes. You might even feel angry sometimes. You really wish your dad or your mom or whoever wasn't behaving that way. I would be dealing with the child's own experience rather than trying to give them explanations. Older kids, teenagers, different story. But I'd be very careful about trying to get kids to understand their parents. It's not their job to understand their parents. It's their job to be understood. We have another question, Dr. Mate, from somebody here in the room with us here in West Palm Beach. Will you just briefly introduce yourself and, and feel free to talk to Dr. Mate? Sure, Dr. Mate, thank you for spending this time with us. I'm Madeleine Takur. I run the Children's Movement of Florida. And my question is, we've all heard about the sensitive period for brain development in the zero to five years. Yeah. I'm wondering if the same kind of sensitive period reemerges among new parents. I have an intuition or maybe it's an optimism that it does and that that might have implications for two generation healing. Can you explain the question a bit more? Like, you mean, do the parents become more sensitive at that time? Do they have a, a sensitive period for brain healing in connecting with their child? Well, well what a great question. So, by the way, uh, teenagehood is another sensitive period, you know, we have to acknowledge, okay? Um, what happens to, for parents, now, this depends the degree to which the parent is involved with the child. But particularly for mothers, um, there's a whole hormonal shift that happens around pregnancy and delivery. Those hormones sensitize the brain necessarily because a whole new relationship has to develop and the mother develop in the mother there's released all these this love cocktail basically that makes you very vulnerable and very sensitive when the environment is not supportive that mother may develop postpartum depression postpartum depression is not an isolated disease of the woman it's a reflection of the environment so it is a sensitive period and the more fathers get involved in parenting, cuddling and holding babies, the more sensitized they get because oxytocin is released in their brains and endorphins are released in their brains. And vasopressin is released in their brains. So parenting certainly 
uh, sensitizes the parent as long as the parent is involved with the child. And it is also a time when some childhood traumas can emerge for the new parents because the vulnerability of the child brings up their own vulnerability. It's a very sensitive period which needs to be supported. Now, how we evolved as human beings in small band hunter-gatherer groups, there was lots of support around for the young parents. In our society, the parents are often isolated and the support is not there. So that sensitivity becomes a source of maybe anxiety or even depression in too many cases, which it could be an opportunity for growth, as you suggest. I just mentioned one final thing. In the United States, according to reports a couple of years ago, 25% of women have to go back to work within two weeks of giving birth for economic reasons. You know what that means? That means a quarter of our children are being abandoned from the most important relationship in their lives. Then we wonder why there's so much childhood problems. These are huge social questions. But it does mean that the extent that we can, we need to support young parents. We need to support them with food and love and community and contact. That's how we evolved as a, as, as a species. We can't go back, nor do we want to, becoming hunter-gatherers again, but we could certainly learn from what we've lost. Can you please introduce yourself and, and feel sure. free to speak to Dr. Mate? Yes, hi, um, Dr. Mate. My name is Elizabeth Trong. I'm the CFO for Center for Child Counseling. And I loved your comment that uh, in our school system that teaching math or English is not as important as teaching our kids just emotional, social wellness. So if you had a blank slate of what our system, our school system would look like, what is it that we need to teach our kids so that they become, um, you know, well beings themselves? Well, um, can you stay at the mic for a sec? Uh, yes. thank, thanks for the question. Um, if you're growing plants in a garden, would you be asking yourself, what do I teach these plants to be successful adult plants? No, because they don't hear me. <laughs> yes. What question would you be asking yourself? You mean for kids? No, for plants. For plants. Oh, I don't have a green thumb. Oh, but okay. what I, do don't, they I, don't, I don't either. What do they but what, need? Yes. What do they need? Right. Thank you. That's what I want to ask you. It's the same with healthy emotional development for kids. It's not what we teach them. It's what do they need? When you meet their emotional needs, they're automatically developed. That's nature's agenda. Nature's agenda for any creature, wolf, dolphin, rat, elephant, human being, orangutan, is to develop into a mature adult. It's not a question of what we teach them so much as what conditions do we give them where the natural development can, can take place spontaneously. If you respect kids, they'll learn respect. If you, if you respect their boundaries, they'll learn about boundaries. If you treat them with empathy, they'll develop empathy. We don't have to have a course in empathy, just treat them empathetically. So it's not so much a matter of formal teaching. Now, if I could redesign to answer your question more specifically, if I could redesign the school system, first of all, I would teach teachers about human psychological development, which is astonishing, isn't it? That the people in whose presence our kids spend most of our time don't get a single lecture on human development or on brain development or what the emotional needs of the child are or that when kids are acting out, that means something. You know, take this phrase, acting out. Who's acting out? Which means he's being obstreperous, rude, disruptive, oppositional. That's not what acting out means. Acting out is a good English phrase. It means you're portraying in behavior something you haven't got the language for. If you are playing a game of charades where you're not allowed to speak, what do you have to do to portray the message? You have to act it out. Our kids don't have emotional language, so they act it out in behavior. Then we punish them for it. Rather than 
asking ourselves, what's the message? So, Elizabeth, to answer your question, finally, I would teach them emotional language. The one thing I would teach them is, when you feel this way, here's the word for it. And you're safe to come and talk to me about it. So I give them safety and I give them emotional language. Other than that, I give them the conditions and trust their own development. Okay? Dr. Mate, we, we could all spend the rest of the night in this room <laughs> listening to you and having this dialogue, but unfortunately we're out of time. Uh, I just want us all to give Dr. Mate a huge round of applause for enlightening us, speaking with us today. Well, uh, again, thank you. It's my pleasure. And um, I, I just um, want to express my appreciation for what you're up to, for why you gathered here today and the work that you do, uh, especially in this uh, toxic culture of ours. It's, it's such a redemption and it's so necessary. So thank you. Thank you. It's, hang on for just a minute because I want you to hear this part, Dr. Mate. We want to talk to you about Dr. Mate's five books right now and where you can get his latest copy too. Um, we're going to show that here on the screen. Also, for everyone in this room, if you donate $50 or more to Center for Child Counseling, you will receive a copy of one of Dr. Mate's books while copies last. We have a bunch of stacks over there. You want to act fast because they will run out. Uh, but for now, we have to. Um, we have a very important message for you. It is my pleasure to now welcome up here our event co-chair, Julie Fisher Cummings, with the Love Light Foundation to share a few words. And again, Dr. Mate, thank you so much for being with us all today. Thank you. Dr. Mate, thank you so much. I feel healed just being in your presence. Um, I want to thank. Can I, th can, I tell, can I tell my Where wife? That? Can I tell my wife that that you said that? What did he say? <laughs> yeah, please tell your wife. We have okay. to tell her as well. Thank, thank you. I'd like to ask her to come into the room. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, that you didn't. Please. I just wanted to thank the Leones for hosting us here. You're great advocates for our most vulnerable children. And I want to thank everyone for being here today. It just shows that you really care. Um, they wanted me to really talk about the, how we can take action. But I think what I learned most from Dr. Mate today is we can just be empathetic witnesses and validate all of our children inside of each of us, as well as the emotions of everyone else. And I think that's a good start, put human, loving human kindness at the center of all our behavior. And I think it will make a difference in our world. But I have hope with someone like him in this world. Um, also, they want me to speak about what would be your personal call to action. You could take a training, the ACE is aware, and I know that Renee does these incredible training programs. In fact, we're going to be bringing her to Detroit for the Fisher Foundation to train our early child care workers. Um, they sought that out, and uh, that's very hopeful. You can be a business leader who boldly invests in it. You can back policy. And I know Caitlin, my associate, was going to ask a question on what, what kinds of policies do we need? Um, or you can give a gift. All of those are very important. And I'm just really grateful you're all here today. Um, and just to take a stand and be a very, what did he say, an empathetic witness. And I think that's a start. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julie. I know I speak for everyone this evening when I say it was an honor to be part of Lead of the Fight Part 2 2023. It was the dream of Renee Lehman and her entire team uh, to bring Dr. Mate to our community and our friends around the world. I'm talking this was her number one, and you've done it, and what a critical conversation we had today. We are thrilled to share that on April 19th, Lead the Fight 3 will feature Fritzi Hortzman with the Compassion Prison Project to bring us the topic of trauma-informed work among our incarcerated community members. 
Although we are closing out this afternoon right now, lead the fight, as we all know, is never over. It's always moving forward. With all our gratitude for everyone in attendance and for taking the time, we wanna say thank you so much. We will all stay in this fight and just thank you everyone for being here.